Well, welcome back to part two of the Judgment Seat of Christ. And we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, we did verse 12 the last time. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. So we determined that this was simply meaning the different building materials that we have in our lives that God has given to us as gifts that we build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. So now we're in verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So the immediate focus is not only just the work, but on the day. I am sure of this, Philippians 1, 6 states, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. There it is right there, again, the day. And then in 1 Corinthians 1 again, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then back to Philippians 1, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. There it is again. And 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Or you could just say the day again. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 1, the Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So there's another phrase that's all over the New Testament. And then Jesus himself said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So that's what we are looking forward to on the day. So every man shall have praise. You may only have a little piece of precious stone and a little hunk of gold left in your little pile when the fire's done and God will say, here's your reward. You were faithful in that little. So there's coming this day, as we just looked at all through the New Testament, the day when everybody's work is going to be tested. It, it's just like we're all going to take our building up to heaven and God's going to light them and and see and see what's it what it's made of so in essence this is a testing every man's work is going to be tested why so god can determine what's left and on what's left he's going to do what punish you no he's going to reward you so in this concept, there's no real judgment whatsoever. And he's looking at the workmanship. The fire of God's judgment will test the quality of each person's work and its workmanship, but not the person. The durability or the transience of those works will then become apparent. And as it says in Hebrews 8.12, I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. 
So this is further proof that this is not about sin or any real judgment. That stuff is gone, long gone. You know, remember what the Old Testament said, as far as the east is from the west. So you see, the judgment seat of Christ isn't a sin thing at all. It's a time of receiving. It's a time of being pleasing and yet more being well-pleasing. That's what the Lord accepted literally means. We're going to be made manifest to Jesus Christ to receive a reward in accordance with the things which we have done in our body, whether they be good or bad. Now here's a nice quote from Dr. D.A. Carson on what basically goes on in many churches today. If the church is being built with large portions of charm, personality, easy oratory, positive thinking, managerial skills, powerful and emotional experiences, and people smarts, and without the repeated passionate spirit, anointed proclamation of Jesus Christ and him crucified, we may be winning more adherents than converts. There's the issue. He ended it by saying, the heart of genuine worship is the working out in every aspect of our lives, the confession, Jesus is Lord. That's our goal. So, as it says in 1 Corinthians, as Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. So the fundamental, non-negotiable, that upon which the church is no longer the church is the gospel. God's folly. Jesus Christ and him crucified. So this is not what we know of as the social gospel or seeking the public good. Okay, so a good definition for this. The social gospel is a philosophy and religion that the church should concern itself with worldly problems rather than with spiritual ones. It is more interested in ecology, biology, psychology, sociology than in theology. It is more concerned about preserving the whooping crane and the alligator than about preaching Christ, the emancipator. It spends more time fighting earthly pollution that may damage the body than with fighting spiritual plagues that damage certainly and will damn the soul. So as Second Timothy, Paul said there in chapter four, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. So we need to be looking forward to this crown. The Lord is going to give me, and not to me only, but to all that love his appearing. It's going to be given when he comes, and it is not a penalty. It's a reward. So you see, he's simply using the idea of fire here, not as damnation, but fire fits in terms of the combustible materials of your building. So whatever is left, God's going to reward you for it. And it's pretty clear in the context of this section of scripture. So verses 14 and 15. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So whenever in your life you teach or you learn sound doctrine, you obey sound doctrine, you pass it on to somebody, that's gold, silver, precious stones. Whenever you are motivated by willful, unselfish love for the glory of God, that's gold, silver, precious stones. 
whenever your daily conduct is holy and righteous and your service is spiritual and beneficial and faithful, again, that's gold, silver, precious stones. And God knows. God will evaluate it and you will be rewarded. Now, as Matthew 6 says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Here we go. This verse points specifically at this, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So if the servant of the Lord has made a lasting contribution to the building of the church by emphasizing some aspect of the gospel, he or she will receive a reward. The rewards in view seems to be opportunities to glorify God by serving him. So it's in this concept of crowns and I don't know what else. I don't know how the rewards are going to work out I don't know how it is that God's going to reward us unless it's just a greater capacity for praising him, for honoring him, for giving him glory. But somehow he's going to reward us if there's anything left. And this idea of crowns is all through the New Testament. The incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians 9, the crown of righteousness, we already looked at that verse the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5, the crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2, and the crown of life in James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10. So it is perfectly proper to serve Christ to gain a crown. The crown is a symbol of a life of faithful service that we performed out of gratitude for his grace to us. Another term we could use would be our obedience. So uh, let's recall a sermon on the Mount. And really that sermon was basically all about rewards. Now, if the idea of serving God for a reward makes you uncomfortable, may I suggest that you read again the Sermon on the Mount I mean, it's all through there, and we don't need to respond like we know better than God, like this picture shows us. <laughs> there, Jesus repeatedly appealed to his hearers to follow his teaching with the prospect of receiving an eternal reward for doing so. Scripture appeals to us on many levels to serve the Lord. Certainly, love for him should be our primary motivation. So often it will make us feel uncomfortable thinking about, well, okay, I'm doing this and I'm going to get a reward. Well, if that's your thinking, that's not the correct way to approach it. And many people look at this like, well, this kind of tips on the idea of legalism. Well, if we look at the Bible, legalism is a process of placing yourself under the authority of religious men who add their commandments and their traditions to the scriptures. Sounds like some other denominations that we know of. It is not about placing yourself under the authority of your creator or under the authority of his commandments. Whole different ball game. And in Ephesians 2.10 answers this question for us. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So technically, it's not really our workmanship. He created them. He prepared them a long time ago. So that word work, ergon in the Greek, deed that carries out or completes an inner desire so that it does address motives. This idea of work is motivational. So it looks like all the works we will be rewarded for are actually given to us, set up for us by God in eternity past. So just think about that. That can stump you for a while. And then when we look at Revelation 4, this kind of lets us in what we're going to do with those crowns. 
The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. <laughs> so besides, we will use those rewards to serve and worship him more perfectly. That is amazing. Like I said, it's amazing, but it's true. And then it says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So you might say, oh, you mean all my life I was doing this or that and it was all stubble? Well, sorry about that. Make sure you're doing the best thing. Not the good thing, but the best thing. Make sure you're using yourself in the very best way. As it says in the book of Jude, and have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire. So here's that idea. That's that same idea back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So here in Jude, the context identifies those who suffer loss as being Christians, who seek to build the church with materials that fail to withstand God's assessment. Basically, they're building with worldly things. They do not refer to all carnal Christians, though carnal Christians may fail to make lasting contributions to the church. And earlier in chapter 3, right at the beginning, it says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly mere infants in Christ. So there's the problem right there. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Kind of like spending 50 minutes of an hour long service just singing praise songs. And then you just get a little bloop of the Bible. That's not right. So in essence, Paul is telling them, verse three there, you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? And then he goes on about their divisiveness. So it is then a process of God subtracting the worthless ones from the valuable ones and then rewarding the believer on the basis of the valuable. So it is only a question of sorting out the bad from the good in the sense of what is valuable. And a better way to put it, it could be, you might just state it, it's things that are worthwhile. So you're going to lose a reward if you're doing things out of context, out of your uh, appropriate thought process. So it's actually something you didn't have in the first place. As 2 Corinthians 5, 9, look this at this again. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. <clears throat> so not every believer is ambitious for the Lord. That's the problem. But every believer is going to appear before the Lord. And now is the time to prepare. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, our purpose is to please God, not people. He is the one who examines the motives of our hearts. There, is, there it is again, our motives. 2 John 8, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. There it is again. Colossians 2, 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So stuff like that social gospel idea falls right into this category. So the focus is on whether our works are good or whether they are bad, phallos in the Greek. And really that doesn't mean what we would think is bad. It just means, you know, 
unvaluable, ordinary. You're going to be judged on what is good and what is worthless, not what is evil. And what is worthless is burned up, and there's no reward for that. Now, verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So what is this? Well, this is probably the strongest warning in the New Testament against taking the church lightly and destroying it with the world's wisdom and division. Now, it's not talking about outside um, information, but it's talking about people who are actually in the church, but bring with it worldly wisdom and try to you know, argue with people about doing things the way they want to do it. So Paul was not speaking here of individual believers being temples of God, though we are. And that actually comes up in 1 Corinthians 6.19. Or of the church universal as the temple of God, although the universal church is a temple of God. And you can see that in Ephesians 2.19-22. He meant the collective body of believers that make up the local church, as it is clear from his use of the plural you in the Greek and the singular temple. So he's putting the plural with the singular. So that equals the local congregation and was not just any building. And this idea actually comes from the Old Testament. But if a person who is unclean does not purify himself, he must be cut off from the community because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. So there it is. The priest only went in once a year. And man, he had to go through this great rituals, this all this rigmarole to get in there if it was in and it was incredible. And if you get in there and there was one sin in his life that hadn't been taken care of, he dropped dead right on the spot, or if he didn't follow God's commands exactly, just like Uzzah did, touching the Ark of the Covenant, but they were moving it unscripturally. So, Ecclesia, the church, the New Testament writers speak often of the church, the group of believers as God's temple. And they did not usually make it the, the distinction between the holy place and the holy of holies, that existed in the Israelite physical temples. They viewed the temples as a whole. So this is the entire group of local believers, the Ecclesia. And this is an example of the Old Testament lex talionis, the law of retaliation. If you come in the local church among the believing element as an unbeliever and you seek to corrupt the church and cause the church to turn away from the one foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy you. You destroy the church, he will destroy you. And that's precisely what he says here. Here's verse 17 again. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. And there, there's further evidence of it's the local congregation all together is the temple. So if any servant of the Lord tears down the church instead of building it up, God will tear him or her down. And look at Acts 9, 1 through 4. He usually does this by sending temporal discipline in, the, in one form or another. Back in Exodus, it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So God is jealous of his own, and he will destroy anyone who destroys his church. Somebody who comes along and tries to undo what God has done, somebody who comes along and tries to hinder the work of the church, somebody who comes along and tries to remove the foundation of Christ, they're just setting themselves up in a position to be dealt with by God. 
So if anyone destroys God's temple, that word destroys in the Greek, pathero, corrupt, or they ruin it to cause or experience moral deterioration. There's the focus right there due to the corrupting influence of sin. So it's very serious business. Don't mess with God's local church. And there are people in our Christian churches who bring into membership of the church the unsaved, and a lot of times even by baptism, though they haven't been born again. They have not believed. And you can usually tell people like that when they point to their baptism as being a member of the church. They come in because their brother is a member or their father is a member or cousin or mother or they have family ties. They are brought into the Christian church by education because they're highly educated and they're friendly to religion or they're wealthy individuals and they can contribute greatly and in fact do contribute greatly to the Christian church. But in so doing, they come in and ultimately the Christian church becomes a hollow shell. It's no longer a Christian church at all. The destruction of the church is taken very seriously by the Lord God because the local church is a holy temple unto the Lord. So he's looking for this unity in Christ. Paul ended his discussion of the local church as he did to stress the importance of the work that all God's servants were doing at Corinth. He also did so to stress the need for unity of viewpoint in the congregation. And that's actually pointing at the fact that theology is important, doctrine is important. Isaiah 62, three says, you shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. So one of the reasons that we want to have a crown is to show the Lord we love him and show him faithful service. But another reason is that we may cast them at his feet in praise and adoration. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. He won't forget what you're doing, even though nobody else notices. A.W. Tozer has some great points on this. He says, our motives in the Christian life should be both right and genuine. God is the faithful one. We ought to love him and serve him because he is God, not because of the gracious things he does for us or for the rewards he promises us. However, it should be said that God does not expect us to forget or ignore the gracious future promises he has made to us. It is a glorious truth that if we believe God and honor his word, if we walk by faith and love and obedience, there will be eternal rewards for us, for each of us in that great coming day. The rewards will differ. Wisdom and knowledge and love reside in him who is our God. He will make the right judgments for his people. Deeds done in the spirit in obedience to Christ and with the purpose of bringing honor to the triune God are seeds of endless blessedness. So that's the judgment seat of Christ, or we should just say the Bema seat. And compared with the great white throne judgment, totally different. Bema seat only for believers, white throne judgment un unbelievers. Bema rewards, white throne punishment. So, and the list goes on and on. And here's several key verses that talk about the judgment seat of Christ. So that's just for your info. Write them down if you want to or take a screenshot. So thank you very much for listening to this lesson. I just thought I needed to clear up where Christians are and what we are doing when this great white throne judgment comes along. We might be there. We probably will be there, but we will not be judged. So thank you for listening. 
and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for the teachings of the Apostle Paul that clear these things up for us. And may you bless us richly in our obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So until next time, goodbye.